Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Rebay, the host of the Civics Project, which is sponsored by Repair. I'm really glad to be back with you this week for our 40th episode in 2021 on Certified Organic Standards. Before we begin, I want to start with a brief land acknowledgement. Repair acknowledges the Gabriolina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatong, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, the elders, and Iohinkam, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. As noted, today's focus is on certified organic standards. And I wanna begin with just a tiny snapshot. We can't be comprehensive in limited time, but I wanna talk a little bit about the history and the concept of organic foods and organic farming and organic products domestically in the United States and also globally. So the first discussion of what would come to be termed organic standards foods or farming emerged in the early 1900s as, as farmers started to introduce synthetic fertilizers made with nitrogen and also chemical pesticides into farming. These were not at least common or widespread practices domestically or globally before the 20th century. They accompanied the growth of the um, industrial revolution and the transition towards agribusiness. And so as we start to see farming get more centralized and to be affected by contemporary early 20th century technologies, uh, we start to see some people talk about food safety and uh, quality uh, in the context of all that early chemical use and uh, use of synthetic products that were basically new in agriculture. The term organic farming didn't actually show up until 1940 and is attributed to an advocate in the United Kingdom, uh, but it was adopted over time across various kinds of locations. Somewhat in the US and Europe, the organic foods movement also eventually became very powerful in India and some other non-Western countries. In the United States in the 1950s, uh, the Rodale Press, and that's spelled R-O-D-A-L-E, Rodale Press, started to raise consciousness about organics and to promote organic gardening uh, through publications at the time. So to try to sort of educate the public about the importance of organic standards, but there was nothing in policy in the United States or basically on any mass scale globally you know, meaning uh, to my knowledge in the 1950s, no country had anything comparable to a national organic standard in the way that we think of it now. In 1962, Rachel Carson, who was recognized as a pretty prominent scientist at the time, published the book Silent Spring about the use of pesticides with a particular emphasis on a pesticide known as DDT, which has proven to be extremely harmful in the human body, including uh, for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, and so the Silent Spring got people talking about the issue more in the United States and the book had a global readership and impact as well and helped to catalyze in 1972, the ban of DDT, the, one of the pesticides she emphasized most heavily in the United States. So 10 years after her book publication of Silent Spring. Uh, in 1972, uh, we also saw the formation of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements, or IFOM. So that again was in 1972, almost 50 years ago now. And that became the sort of major entity between and across national borders to be pushing for organic food standards. And so then what we started to see was different nations respond to that pressure over time. And it's important to understand that the question of organic foods is very transnational because by the 1970s and 80s, you were starting to see food imports and exports increasing. You know, so again, it certainly was true before the Industrial Revolution that almost all the food 
that people ate was locally grown because transportation, transportation systems were simply not set up to promote food storage without spoilage. Uh, to transport it uh, to other parts of the world with the exception of certain products that are less perishable like spices and teas and things like that and some other non-perishable goods. But for the most part, it was simply most functional and cost effective to grow the food where people were going to eat it. And so as you start to see food be shipped around the world, this also means that food standards uh, globally uh, become an area of concern. So, you know, what one nation does is going to have an impact on the bodies and the environment and other nations. In addition, we started to see agricultural products, including, chemi including chemical pesticides, fertilizers, fungicides, um, and other sorts of products uh, associated with food production, you know, again, be um, produced and transported between national borders. So food standards stopped being a localized issue in, in the way that they might have been, let's say, 100 years before, or even 50 years before. In the European Union, the EU, after the formation of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements, started to engage in more agricultural subsidy reforms. So basically to say, you know, if the state's going to be putting money into agricultural industries in a particular area, we want to be sure that it's, it's safer. And so some aspects of what we now think about as organic standards were built into their food supply in that way. Uh, we didn't really see major headway in the United States, though, until 1990, so 18 years after the formation of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements and about 40 years after the Rodale Press had started promoting organics in the United States. So in 1990, the U.S. Congress finally passed organ the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990. And for those who are interested in actually finding it, if you wanted to look it up, and it would show up in the US Department of Agricultural Regulations under the uh, citation CFR, right? Just basically meaning it's a federal rule. Title seven, subtitle B, chapter one, subchapter M. And then in subchapter N, you'd have to look up the OFA provisions for Organic Foods Production Act, part 205. And there you would see laid out what's called the National Organic Program. And that contains all the rules, which are, have sometimes been amended or updated over time since 1990 that govern organic food standards in the United States. So organic food standards are largely under the authority of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but there, there are times when the Environmental Protection Agency is called into play, particularly because they have a lot of authority over chemical pesticides. And sometimes Health and Human Services and also, is also involved, and occasionally the Food and Drug Administration. For the most part, though, organic food standards are upheld under the U.S. Department of Agriculture through an entity supervised by the USDA titled the National Organic Standards Board. So the National Organic Standards Board, which is enforcing the provisions of the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990 uh, and any updated amendments since then. So in a nutshell, I'm going to overview what does that all actually mean? What are certified organic standards in the United States? The, so I'll go over four major components, though I want to disclaim first that this is not everything that's relevant or interesting in the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990. It's most of it, but it's not complete. And to really dive into every rule or procedure that goes into organic certification in the United States, you would have to actually dive into uh, Title VII, Subtitle B, Chapter 1, Subchapter M, OFA Provisions, Part 205, and read the latest detail. With that said, here are four major elements of organic standards in the United States. The first is compliance with what's called the national list in the legislation. So the national list refers to a list uh, including chemical and non-chemical products. 
if a product is not a chemical and it's not on the list, then it's okay to use. If a product is not a chemical, it's a natural substance and it is on the list, then it is not okay to use. So what I'm saying is if it's not a chemical, it's something that comes from nature, from plants, um, it's okay to use unless it show up, so it shows up on the list. And it, an example of that is arsenic, uh, which many of us know of as a poison, uh, but it's not a chemical, it's plant derived. So arsenic is a natural substance, which is why you'll hear about it in older literature and mystery novel plots, arsenic being used as a poison before mainstream chemical poisons were invented or widely available. And so arsenic is plant derived, but it's on the national list telling farmer, farmers you can't use arsenic as a pesticide, which makes perfect sense because ingesting ar arsenic would be very dangerous to people eating crops that were grown with arsenic or animals that were fed with arsenic based food. So arsenic is an example of a natural product that cannot be used, but unless it shows up on the list, anything natural you can use. So you can use ladybugs and you can use um, salt and you can use all sorts of other, you know, plant-based products to deal with pests or treat your food. The national list also contains a list of chemical pesticides or insecticides. And if it shows up on the list and it's a chemical, that means you are allowed to use it. If it does not show up on the list, everything else is banned for organic foods. So basically the food industries, if they want to, can try to lobby to get exceptions for some chemical pesticides, insecticides, or fungicides to be included on the list based on the argument that they are not dangerous enough to humans or the environment to ban in organic food production. And so there's a short-ish list, which uh, some agricultural um, lobbies are always trying to grow. They're trying to get more chemicals added to the safe enough list, basically. So there are a few chemical products you can use, a few natural products you can't use. Uh, and otherwise, anything that's not on the list is not allowed if it's a chemical and is allowed if it's natural. So that's the way the national list works. And again, it's a subject of ongoing tension with growers and other lobbyists sometimes trying to change the composition of the list and organic foods advocates sometimes trying to get things taken on or off the list for safety purposes. So the national list is one. And when you ask people, what does organic food mean? It, most people will say, well, there were no pesticides. And the pesticides portion is what's encompassed in the national list, but there are actually a lot of other provisions of organic growing standards. So I'm gonna move on to three more. So compliance with the national list is one. The second is what's called ionizing radiation and also known as irradiation, irradiation, IRR radiation, or IR radiation of food. And what this refers to is basically bombarding the food with gamma rays. Uh, and it sounds like Star Trek or Star Wars or some sort of science fiction, but gamma rays are something which can be basically used to treat food uh, in part because they can sometimes kill off pests. So they can kill bugs or other sorts of pests that are attacking food. Uh, but, but farmers often have another motiv motivation to irradiate foods and that's that it changes the chemical structure or the biochemical structure rather of the food product sometimes in ways that can be used to slow down ripening and therefore reduce food spoilage. So some growers want to irradiate the food because they get more of the product to market without spoilage. It lasts longer in the stores before, it, before you purchase it and they make more money that way. So radiation is a way to deal with pests. It's also a way to make some types of produce spoil less quickly. So all that sounds nice, right? Getting rid of pests and not having food spoil as quickly. So we can ask ourselves, well, why is this an issue? And then why not irradiate foods? And the reason is that in changing the biochemical structure of the food, uh, there are a couple of potential, several potential impacts. One is just that the food may lose some of its nutritional value. 
Um, so when you're changing the chemical structure of the food, it might destroy some vitamins or minerals or other nutritional resources within the food. It might make the food harder to absorb or digest so that even if the nutrition is in the food, you're absorbing less of it, more of it is passing out of your system as waste. Um, and a third major concern with the radiation is that sometimes by changing the biochemical composition of the of food at, at the molecular level, you're creating basically unstable molecules within the food. And those unstable molecules are what we think of as um, free radicals, meaning basically substances which can cause, once they're in your body, damage to your cells. So if you're ever hearing somebody talk about free radicals and antioxidants, the basic idea is that a radiated food has more unstable molecules which can scar or damage cells in your body. And that, in, among other things, can increase your cancer risk. So foods that are irradiated may, in some instances, become significantly more carcinogenic, more likely to promote the growth of cancers or start cancerous cells growing. So there are health risks associated with irradiation and also losses of the nutritional value associated with, with irradiation. And farmers will often feel like, look, if you know my food is is not getting spoiled and this is a way to get rid of pests, you know, I'd still like to do this. And so the organic food movements have stepped in. And I don't, I'm not saying all farmers want to do this, but those that do, especially when we're talking about large corporate agricultural businesses, which are focused on their stockholders and their bottom line and how to, you know, sort of make the most money off of what they grow. Uh, so you don't want to picture small farmers as much here, but large agricultural giants. Um, one of the reasons to include ir irradiation in the organic standards is to basically say, like, we can't trust the market to just decide for us how many carcinogens can be in our food and how much of the nutrition in food should be protected. And of course, if you buy a piece of produce, there's absolutely no way to tell by looking at it, tasting it or touching it, was it irradiated? So this is also one of the reasons it's included in organic standards because it gives um, basically consumers some way to monitor what they're being exposed to. So that's irradiation, also known as ionizing radiation. The third major requirement for organic certification is that if you are certifying a food product as organic, that means that it cannot involve genetic modification. So this is a term that people have heard of more. You may see foods having the label no non-GMO or no GMO. Um, Europeans have, or some Europeans have, have coined the term Franken foods, as in Frankenstein, like food basically that was sort of stitched together haphazardly and in ways that don't quite work by science. So uh, thinking about uh, genetic modification, there can be different motivations that farmers have to genetically modify food. As an example, um, the first class I ever took at the age of 17 as a college student was a class on ecology and human intervention. I still remember learning at the time that there was uh, watching a documentary in which we learned that farmers wanted to be able to, or really in this case, what we're talking about is massive agricultural companies that were growing, um, wanted to be able to shoot tomatoes down a chute into a truck at 50 miles an hour without the tomatoes getting flattened or bruised. So tomatoes at 50 miles an hour. And so they genetically modified the skin of the tomatoes to be much thicker and tougher so that it could basically be survive being catapulted and hurled at 50 miles an hour into a truck bed. Um, and so the reasons for genetic modification that you sometimes hear is like, oh, we're going to make food prettier or bigger or sweeter or something. And sometimes the, the motive, those are the motivations, but a fair amount of time, the motivation is about some kind of practical or industrial purpose. Sometimes it's about making the food ripen more slowly. Sometimes it is about growing larger um, or sweeter or something else or getting the seeds out. Um, but the basic idea of genetic modification is that somewhat like irradiation, you are changing the food at a molecular level. 
and the risks associated with genetic modification are similar to irradiation meaning that when you genetically modify food, you may make it a lot harder to digest or absorb or to do so without more strain on your digestive system, your stomach, your intestines, your whole gastrointestinal system. And we can think about that when we think of those 50 50 mile an hour thick skin tomatoes, how hard if the skin is thickened to the point where it can Uh, not bruise while traveling at 50 miles an hour and hitting at that impact, right? If it can do that, uh, how hard is that tomato skin going to be on our digestive system, right? So some of it is about, you know, again, is the food complete? Is it too hard to to digest? Genetic modification can sometimes have the effect, often does have the effect of stripping at least some helpful nutrients from the food. So food gets nutritious which is one of the reasons that a number of Western European countries make fun of the US uh, food market and talk about Franken foods saying like we have these bizarre genetically engineered foods which are uh, not as fresh and don't taste as good and so forth because they've been changed in these ways. Um, But the other major concern with genetic modification is that when you are changing the molecular composition of foods, you know, in this, at this biochemical level, you can create instability in the molecular structure of those foods. And that creates these uh, unstable molecules that enter your body when you eat the food and they can damage the cells in your body and increase the risk of cancerous cells beginning to form. Uh, Can also cause over time if with enough accumulated damage, uh, weakness to your immune system or to other organs of the body. So eating a little bit of genetically modified food, which we've certainly in the United States all done, uh, it's just unavoidable in our market, um, doesn't mean that you're immediately gonna grow a tumor or uh, be unable to digest your food. But you know, in accumulated quantity, the risk with genetic modified foods is that not only are you getting less nutrition, but uh, you are potentially over time increasing your cancer risk or doing other sorts of damage to your immune system. So genetic modification is prohibited in any food that's certified organic. So just to confirm what we've reviewed so far, if it is certified organic, it can't have been genetically modified, it cannot have been irradiated, and it cannot have used any chemical products unless they are on the exceptions category on the national list. Uh, and would have been natural only and also not have used any natural products that are banned on the national list like arsenic, right? So less toxic, no irradiation, uh, no genetic modification. There's one last rule, and this is the one that usually people have not heard of and it always shocks folks. And that's that uh, certified organic food uh, may not have used sewage sludge as a, as a fertilizer. So when I say sewage sludge, you're going like, she can't mean that. And I do mean sewage sludge basically is anything that has been flushed, poured, or dumped into the U.S. wastewater system. So anything that's gone into the sewers, whether down your toilet or down your sink uh, or down industrial sinks and, and chemicals, anything that's gone into the sewers. This creates this vast, very toxic mix of waste products. And the solid parts of that waste basically float to the top of the wastewater in the sewage. And they include, again, any household cleaning product that you use is going down your sink or your toilet or something. So Lysol, but also anything that's going through human bodies as waste and so forth, all of, and also residue from metal pipes, so a certain amount of lead, for instance, is also winding up in the sewers. So the sludge that floats to the top, there are a few things that societies can do with it. Sometimes it just winds up in landfills, but our environmental protection agency, unlike a number of other industrialized nations, has decided that this uh, solid stuff in the, in the sewers, which, you know, is you know, the accumulation of private households, hospitals, chemical, uh, dumping from industries and so forth, all of that, um, you know, public businesses, all of that sewage 
can be taken out of the sewer. It does go through a sewage treatment plant, so it's meant to kill sort of like the worst bacteria. But there's absolutely no way to review, to remove all the poisonous or toxic substances in that sludge that wouldn't cost you know, billions of dollars. It's just impossible to do. And the EPA has basically said, that's okay. You can use it. You can spread that sludge over a field of crops uh, notwithstanding the fact that it includes heavy metals, industrial compounds, some viruses and bacteria, drug residues, and radioactive material. And the reason that farmers do this is because sewage sludge, since it's literally just taken out of the sewers, is extremely cheap, right? So it is the cheapest available form of fertilizer in the United States. And it can help plants grow, albeit not as naturally as they would otherwise because sewage sludge also contains a lot of fecal matter, a lot of poop, basically. And so the same way that farmers will you know, save animal uh, poop as manure and let it compost and then spread it over their fields, you can use human waste in that way. The problem is it's not just, it's not just poop, right? It's everything else that's been dumped in the sewers, which is really dangerous. And so, you know, we've had hundreds of documented cases of people falling ill after being exposed to sewage sludge fertilizer. Symptoms can include respiratory distress, headaches, nausea, rashes, reproductive complications, which, you know, again, can be passed on to fetuses, cysts, and cancerous tumors. There was a case in the federal courts in the 11th Circuit that came up out of the state of Georgia uh, about 13 years ago. So the case citation for those who would like it is McElmurray versus USDA, the US Department of Agriculture in 2008. The uh, case was heard by Judge Anthony Alimo. And this is what he's quoted as saying after hearing all the evidence. He says, senior environmental protection uh, association officials took, or agency officials, took extraordinary steps to quash scientific dissent and any questioning of the EPA's biosolids program. Now, biosolids is the EPA's official name for sewage sludge. So biosolids. Bio meaning basically it's human poop, right? And it's solid. So the judge looked at all the evidence and found that the Environmental Protection Agency had been shown over and over that this form of fertilizer is not safe for humans or for the environment, and they went out of their way to suppress that information. The case, McElmurray versus the U.S. Department of Agriculture, involved the death of uh, herds of dairy cattle who had drunk, um, who had, I'm sorry, eaten food that had been grown um, in sewage sludge, and the sewage sludge contained thallium, which is the primary toxin you find in rat poison. So the sewage sludge was laced with this poison because it had come out of the sewers where people dump things like rat poison and other substances. Um, and it was used in accordance with federal guidelines. So the farmer who was growing this wasn't, you know, circumventing the law. He was doing things exactly as approved by the EPA. Um, and spread this sewage sludge all over, uh, or and the sewage sludge had been fed, spread all over the feed that was given to the cattle, and the cattle ate the food, which was contaminated by sewage sludge fertilizer. It contaminated their milk, which reached reached several states and had measurable amounts of thallium, again the toxin in rat poison. The city of Augusta, Georgia had spread the sludge on the McElmurray farm over an 11 year period. And the court found that the land had become too contaminated to be safe for growing any crops. Right? So basically both the city, which was following EPA guidelines and the EPA were implicated in this suit, which again, killed off these herds of cattle and, spread, and also resulted in the distribution of poisonous milk across states out of Georgia. Um, so one of the things to understand is, you know, there's a host of scientific information that tells us sewage sludge is not safe. And it can be used legally in the United States with any food that is not certified organic. Um, and the 
uh, USDA has not backed down from this position. They've basically said, ultimately, it's better from, for the environment to be reusing the sludge than to just be dumping it in landfills. Um, and there's also indications, right, again, that when you're putting poisonous sewage sludge over fields of crops and it's getting into the soil, it's contaminating that soil over time as well. So it's doing environmental damage in that way. Um, so big sort of environmental questions that are all bound up in questions of food safety at this point. A few other things that I wanna share. So this is sort of the basic concept of why are, what are certified organic standards and why do they matter? I wanna mention our US Food and Drug Administration doesn't have any organic standards for cosmetics. So you could buy a cosmetic product and it would say that it was made with organic components, but there's no regulation of organics in cosmetics or other sorts of products that are not food for the most part in the United States. Um, you could, right? They, the United States could choose to do this. Europe has a system called COSMOS, which stands for Cosmetic, Organic, and Natural Standard, which they maintain um, to, you know, sort of have um, uh, safety uh, standards for cosmetics and body products like shampoos. And the UFDA also has no organics um, for regulating medical or pharmaceutical products, even when they're made with, you know, basically natural ingredients. So our organic standards uh, policy is basically limited to food in the United States. And that's just useful for people to know. The other major issues I want to address, and then I'll close with a list of questions that people commonly have about this and some areas for future reforms. So one of the things I want to talk about is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are a number of existing scientific studies that have linked the likelihood of pandemic breakouts, such as uh, the SARS pandemic earlier, or the SARS breakout earlier, and now our COVID-19 pandemic, to what are called intensive agricultural practices. So intensive agricultural practices are meant to produce a lot of food cheaply and efficiently, and they tend to rely uh, heavily on pesticide and chemical product use. And one of the consequences of intensive agriculture is that, um, that basically we see that using those products, particularly for the farm workers, will lower their disease resistance. So the continued chemical exposure for those working with crops lowers their disease resistance. Um, one of the things that our existing data is telling us, there's a new study that was completed by Dr. Jason Rohr and a number of his colleagues, basically doing a meta-analysis of the existing research. And they found that since 1940, intensive agriculture has been associated with more than a quarter of all infectious diseases that emerged in humans and more than half of all infectious diseases that leaped from animals to humans. And the study tells us that those percentages are likely to increase as more land of the world is converted to farming to agricultural use, which with the global population increasing appears likely to happen. So what this tells us is not that agriculture causes a pandemic, right? It didn't in and of itself cause the COVID-19 pandemic but it significantly increases the likelihood that a disease will become infectious where there's like lower disease resistance in the population that's first infected, that a disease will become infectious to the point of the pandemic, right? So what the science is telling us is if we keep up with our agricultural practices in the way that we are, we should expect to go through more of what we've just been going through with and are still going through right now with COVID-19. In other words, we should expect a pandemic ridden future. That might not mean that there would be another one next year, but it does mean that uh, sort of global pandemics would be something that would become something that would you know occur potentially multiple times in everyone's lifetimes. And you know, one concern like the COVID-19 pandemic, its impact has been absolutely horrible. Um, both, you know, for all of us socially and 
for the people who have died and for their families. Um, and the reality is that, you know, on the scale of how it could be, uh, the COVID death rate is not the highest possible, right? There was an earlier SARS outbreak in the last 20 years, which had a death rate that was more around 20 to 30% of those who were infected as compared to COVID, which is ranging somewhere between one to 5%, depending on the population and the medical response. And so, you know, one of the things we have to keep in mind is how much worse can this get if we don't have major changes in our agricultural practices? This also raises the question of farm worker safety. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is, you know, a lot of times when folks think about what to put in their own bodies, they're sort of like, well, I take vitamins and I exercise and, you know, everything gives you cancer now. I just can't worry about it, but like, I'm going to eat my veggies and I just got to live in the world. And that's really understandable. And it's a choice that you make for you. And we also make economic choices at the grocery store. Am I going to buy something more cheaply that's not organic? Or am I going to buy the organic version that might cost two or three times as much and not everybody can afford um, or will make the choice to buy you know, relatively overpriced organic foods? But one of the challenges here is that regardless of what individuals choose to put into their bodies, we have in the United States a very underpaid, very exploited group of farm workers who are often, you know, being paid sub-minimum wage because they're undocumented or exploitable in other ways. So we've got these very low wage workers who are exposed to whatever's going on in the agricultural industry. And so we see very high rates of illness and disability among migrant farm workers that can't be explained by poverty alone that are about exposure to environmental ha hazards, which are, you know, in, in, in spaces which are in effect their workplaces. So one thing to think harder about organic standards is that um, where they're not present, what we see is a major set of health consequences for farm workers and their families. And because many of the pollutants that are used in agriculture's agriculture are not temporary. They don't just like pass through your system and expose you for a while. Some literally can't be processed. So they will live in your body for the rest of your body, for the rest of your life. And they are transmissible, they're heritable, which means they can be passed through the DNA by mothers and fathers to babies. So thinking about this in terms of just, you know, kind of a human and civil rights perspective, uh, dignity and safety and health for workers, especially those who are, you know, feeding us all, I think is a very important consideration. So I want to move on. I, I mentioned that I'm going to just engage some frequently discussed questions. So one question folks have is, so, you know, they'll say, well, if I eat an all organic diet, does that mean I'm eating healthy? Not necessarily, right? Lots of foods are organic and they're total junk food, right? You can eat um, very greasy French fries, and it can be made with all organic products. You can eat um, lots and lots of organic chocolate and ice cream, right? So uh, the question of when is food healthy is a complex one that has to do with the composition of the food and uh, what your body individually needs and responds best to, and to quantity and to balance and uh, a whole set of things that are not just about growing standards or production standards. And in addition, organic food um, standards only govern the things that the Organic Foods Production Act covers. So they don't in and of itself impose requirements on agribusiness or growers to make sure that there are no, there's no pre-existing contamination in the soil in which they're growing food. Um, and, you know, water quality can still be very poor in particular counties or areas and organic food standards aren't basically applying to the water supply. So the fact that your food is organic, even if it's an otherwise healthy food, it's this nice, pretty, um, you know, a bunch of broccoli, for instance, or kale, and it's certified organic, it could still have pollution, right? Because our land and air and water have been affected for essentially a hundred years now by the industrial revolution, we live in a very polluted environment. So organic food is never perfectly healthy because our environment is not perfectly healthy. Even if we're happy with the existing organic standards and they're adhered to and the certification is done properly, um, 
that's the reality. Our food supply is just not that clean. So another question like folks may then ask is, is organic food healthier than its inorganic counterparts? And ultimately that's something that you could try to answer for yourself based on your own subjective definitions of what is healthy. But what I can say is that yes, on the whole, organic food is likely to be somewhat healthier than the same food product, which was not produced with organic standards. If nothing else, because it's likely to be somewhat less carcinogenic, less cancer causing and may have more nutrients and is less likely to have chemicals, which would make the food harder to digest. So while I would never say it's absolutely always true that organic, every piece of organic food is always the healthiest option on the whole in totality, yes, we can say it is somewhat healthier. <clears throat> um, some folks will say, well, can I just wash it thoroughly, I can get like a vegetable scrub and a brush and just wash off the toxins if I'm buying foods that are not organic. And it certainly doesn't hurt you to do that because you may be able to get some pesticide residue, things that have been sprayed um, off the food if you wash it well and carefully. But we have to go back to that sewage sludge and also the irradiation and genetic modification. Washing foods does nothing uh, to remove any contaminants or risks that are associated with those three practices. So when food has been fertilized with sewage sludge, the sludge seeps into the soil and it becomes the food for your food, right? So if you're growing, let's say carrots and you fertilize it with sewage sludge, the sludge goes into the soil, the carrot derives its nutrients from the soil. So whatever metals or chemicals are in the soil are gonna get absorbed into the carrot. You can't wash that off, it's inside the cells of the food. Some folks will think like, well, if I get something like a peel, like a banana or an orange, I can just peel it off, I can peel off peel of an avocado. That helps to a certain extent, though not entirely, again, with pesticides and fungicides and insecticides. It does not protect you at all when you're talking about sewage sludge fertilizer, and it also does nothing uh, for irradiation or genetic modification. So no, in essence, you can't wash away the poisons. Um, if you, some people ask, like, if I stay, if I eat a hundred percent certified organic diet, will my body be pollution free? And the answer is no. Um, so organic uh, food consumption does not perfectly protect you from pollution because it's in the water supply and in the air and because organic food is not perfectly clean because organic food is still drawn, grown in the soil and with our water supply and is interacting with our air. What organic food standards do is basically prevent the farmers from adding a lot more pollutants, contaminants and risks in the agricultural or um, husbandry that, you know, sort of livestock process, turning animals or plants into food. Um, there are things that the farmers can't do to add to the pollution that's already in the environment but organic food standards don't undo any of that damage. So all of our bodies are already very polluted. That's hard, but that's the truth. And most of the decisions that caused that pollution to enter our bodies were made before we were born. Some of them were made after we were born. Very few of them have been made by us individually. Folks start feeling like guilty, like, oh, I've eaten so much junk food. You know, that's between you and your nutritionist. Um, but even if you had been eating a certified organic diet all of your life, you would still have a significant level of unsafe pollutants in your body because our environment is already contaminated. So that's hard. That doesn't mean you're eating the choice to eat organic food when it's available to you doesn't matter, right? Um, adding more pollution on top of what's already there is never a great idea. Um, but it does mean that we should understand, I think some folks have the idea that as long as you eat organic, you'll be perfectly healthy, your body will be perfectly healthy and clean, and the organic food is perfectly healthy and clean, and that's not the reality. Um, another question folks ask is sort of what's the evidence? Is there really a link between eating organic and getting diseases such as cancer? So this is how I would answer that question carefully. I'd say, yeah, there's evidence. The evidence is complicated and like many things, we always need more data. 
So what does the evidence tell us? They tell us that a lot of the carcinogens that are present in inorganic food um, are linked to cancer and associated with higher rates of cancer. So people who are consuming more cancer causing elements in their food are also sometimes showing up with higher rates of associated cancers. Um, the data on do people who eat all organic get cancer less is mixed. So there is some, and it does indicate that there's a correlation between or eating an organic diet and associate and lowering your cancer risk. But a lot of the data is not large enough yet. So it's suggestive, but it doesn't necessarily prove the link. So what I would say is there's a body of science that leans in the direction mostly of establishing that eating organic can keep you healthier, but that is not developed or substantial or consistent enough yet to indisputably prove it in all cases to everybody. And the data is also different for you know, the association between food consumption and different forms of cancer, right? So for instance, the um, you know, there's some physicians advocacy groups who've started to advocate about the links between dairy and hormone sensitive cancers like breast and ovarian cancer. And some of that is about some substances that are actually natural in dairy, even if it's, um, even if it's uh, produced organically. But some of the linkages between uh, can hormone sensitive cancers and dairy are also about the fact that cattle are often with inorganic food standards being given like um, fertility drugs and antibiotics and basically, you know, products that are meant to keep cows lactating, to keep, have, keep them producing milk and having calves, which are then separated from the mother so that they can keep milking them. Um, so all of that also, you know, is, is certainly linked to some health risks for humans who then consume dairy products. One other folks, one other folks, one other question folks have, excuse me, has to do with um, agricultural subsidies. Like why are organic foods uh, more, are more expensive? Are, you know, organic foods not subsidized by the government? Like we know we have dairy subsidies and other kinds of, uh, farm subsidies, grain subsidies in the United States. So our government does subsidize farmers in times when they might not be able to make a living, uh, you know, basically on their own, just growing the product while also keeping the costs affordable for everybody. And no, there are basically no specific subsidies set up to support organic farming. So, and most of the vast majority of agricultural subsidies in the United States that come out of our tax dollars are going to inorganic, non-organic food production. The other answer to, though to the question of why are organic foods so much more expensive? So one thing we know is that the, you know, it's sort of a problem of the market. So if right now organic food, um, food buying amounts to less than 2%, of all the food that's bought, you know, in grocery stores, restaurants, everywhere. So organic food consumption is, you know, basically a small fraction of all the food that's purchased in the United States and uh, mostly is done by the middle and upper classes. And we have, you know, growing gap between rich and poor in the United States. Uh, so that just means that often, you know, a, a thoroughly organic diet is relatively out of reach for many people. So one of the things we know is that you make profit in part in volume. If you're producing a smaller amount of something, your prices tend to be higher, meaning if let's say 50% of the US public were committing to buy organic foods, you'd start to see the prices come down because it would be more mainstream. It might go up temporarily as the demand outpaced the supply, but as you saw more farmers come, um, transition from inorganic to organic production to meet the public demand, you'd see those prices ultimately decrease and then just start to look like the prices for everything else. With all other things being equal, it doesn't have to be more expensive to produce food organically than inorganically. In fact, one of the things that we've seen in India is that farmers which went through the transition back from inorganic farming, 
to organic farming ultimately said like, I'm making so much more money because um, the quality of the food is better and I have to do so much less work to kind of decontaminate my soil so that I can grow the next year. And so it's actually less expensive than, you know, when I was using all these products that were being marketed to me as the cutting edge and farming these genetically modified seeds and pesticides and fertilizer were ultimately proving more expensive and um, consumers tend to like the taste and quality of organic food better. And that also, you know, creates a positive relationship between growers and uh, the middlemen or middle industries that are delivering direct to consumers or sometimes directly from the farmer to the consumer when you're talking about farmers markets or the public markets. So, you know, one of the things that we see is that ultimately organic food production tends to be either equally or more cost effective, but not at first. You really have to change the way that things are being done at a mass scale and over time uh, to see those benefits. So right now we're sort of in a loop where more people don't buy organic because it's too expensive, but to get the prices down, you have to get more people to buy. Um, and a way out of that would be to do what Europe did and sort of start to practice subsidy reform to say the United States government should uh, invest in making organic food accessible for everybody. Um, and that way the costs will come down and people will get used to it and then that market will regulate itself. So the last question I wanted to review is sort of what changes in policy would be helpful. Um, and I've just mentioned one, which is subsidy reform. I would be very in favor of having less public money going into inorganic food production and more of my tax dollars supporting the production of healthier food. Um, but we also need to see just a major investment in environmental protection across the board, including water quality. So one of the things we know is our organic food is still not clean enough. A, another question folks raise is, you know, in some European countries, whether food is certified organic or not, some things are illegal, right? Many countries don't allow the use of sewage sludge or biosolids as fertilizer on food in the United States does. And I would be very in favor, and I think it's really needed to have some reform in that area to say no more sewage sludge on our foods. We're going to have to find different environmental approaches to um, to managing waste. And we know that this can make people and livestock and our, our environment more polluted. And all of that's really dangerous. So a lot of folks are sort of like, how do we make the organic standards perfect? And how do we make organics affordable? And what I would say is, you know, one thing we can do is just start to push mainstream food standards more in the direction of better environmental protection and food safety. And on top of the, one of the things at the top of that list would be to ban sewage sludge and some of the particularly um, toxic and unsafe pesticides and insecticides and fungicides that we still know to be legal in the United States for the 98 plus percent of food that is not certified organic. So better environmental protection across the board would also be a big help and we need a lot of public education so that people understand what are we eating and why does it matter and why does it why do these practices matter to prevent another COVID-19 and to keep our kids safe and to, you know, have some justice and safety for farm workers in the United States. So my book recommendation for today is an old one and I mentioned it earlier in today's lecture and it's Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Uh, though some of the context of that book is no longer contemporary, it's really important background reading and history to kind of understand what prompted the harder push for environmental regulation and ultimately organic food standards in the United States to know where we came from. And of course, the problems that Carson was writing about in 1962 have not been resolved in our environment, even though DDT was banned, it is still present in our physical environment. We're still getting some exposure to it. Uh, and many of us still have traces of it in our body because it is long lasting. So we can learn more about, again, the sort of history and origins through that text. Thank you everybody who joined us live today. Thank you everybody who's listening remotely. Please come rejoin us next week uh, for episode 41.
um, standardized testing. Uh, and I appreciate you all. Take care.